good evening and welcome. It is time once again for CU Immigration here on WRFU LP, Urbana, 104.5 FM. I will be your host for this evening. My name is Mr. Garza, and I am here to let you know that WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana Champaign community. Yep. Views expressed are those of the speakers and are not intended to represent WRFU, UC IMC, Urbana Socialist Forum, or, as we like to say on the televised version of this show, UPTV. These views are our own. And by our, in this instance, I mean uh, myself, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, or anyone whose opinion I happen to be reading, uh, like a news piece or something like that. Uh, but otherwise, not WRFU, not UCIMC, not Urbana Socialist Forum, not UPTV. So let's get that very, very strict, shall we? Yes, we shall. And thank you for joining me today for this uh, Labor Day special edition. I know if you're watching UPTV or YouTube or any of those sorts of uh, things that this, you'll say, but it's not Labor Day. That was, uh, you know, a week ago or something. <coughs> well, right, you are. Only if you listen to the radio and or check out our live stream will you get this show on Labor Day? But that doesn't mean that uh, it's not sort of about Labor Day or about labor or whatever, because let's face it, <clears throat> immigration and labor in many ways go hand in hand. <clears throat> if you think about it, um, the, I suppose there are some immigrants out there who are like uh, sitting around going, well, let's see, I've got about uh, $10 million in my pocket, I think I will go to the U.S. and live there. And they come to the U.S. without a thought in the world of uh, performing any sort of labor. But that's probably a distinct minority of the people that uh, come to this country or go from any country to any other country. <coughs> Generally speaking, the reason you go is you want to make a new life there. And when you want to make a new life, that will include some form of labor. <clears throat> now, I am I, aware that like myself, and having almost undoubtedly been raised in, in the existing system, when you think of labor, you think of having a job going to work. That's what labor is. But <clears throat> that is actually a byproduct of our sort of capitalist free market sort of system. Uh, because really, work used to be something that you did for yourself, basically. You know, you would uh, labor in your field if you were producing crops. You would labor by going out and trying to hunt animals, if that was the way you survived. You would labor by uh, building or putting together some sort of shelter for yourself, finding water, taking it to <clears throat> where you needed it to be, um, any number of things. I mean, you'd have to make clothes, you'd have to make tools, you had to make all sorts of things. So work used to be something that um, we all did for ourselves or for our family, community, however, you know, however that worked out, it was in some way directly related to uh, what you put into it and what you got out of it were pretty well balanced out. There were situations, of course, uh, in times of um, drought, for example, so that uh, the labor you put into working your fields didn't pan out in getting anything back, or scarcity of animals, and so the labor you put into hunting, you know, you didn't come home with anything. But <clears throat> within a fairly reasonable set of boundaries, most of the time, um, the effort you put into your labor more or less equaled out to what you would get from it. 
And so the, from that, you get a lot of, uh, if you'll think back to old, old stories, you get a lot of stories about how, you know, uh, a lot of times they would they'd anthropomorphize animals and they'd say, oh, the industrious, you know, bee or whatever is, you know, puts in all this work while the lazy whatever doesn't. And, and you know, so the industrious squirrel gets all the nuts and the lazy turtle doesn't get anything or whatever, you know, those stories would be. <coughs> teaching you, rightfully, that uh, if you expected to get anything out of life, to get anywhere, to to have things that you needed, you had to work for them. And when the system sort of took over, <laughs> as it were, I mean, of course, obviously, you know, when in feudal systems where you have uh, lords and slaves and, and, and serfs and that sort of thing, you know, the the effort that the serfs put in didn't equal what they got out of it because most of it went to the, to the Lord. But, you know, if you think about it, <clears throat> that system is not all that different from what we live in today. <laughs> you go, oh, but no, I'm not a slave. I'm not a, <clears throat> a servant. I'm not a serf. Uh, you know, I can change jobs. I can do whatever. But if you think about the amount that you work, versus what you get for it, it's not very equal, really. And and that is something that I think bears remembering on this Labor Day, on Labor Day, any Labor Day, but this one in particular, <clears throat> because it's, it is an important thought that for thousands of years now, there have been people who found some way or another to turn over that system so that instead of the amount of work you did equaled the amount of reward you got for it, more or less, given barring natural disasters and, and you know unforeseen circumstances and things like that, to a system where the amount of work you did, the benefits of your work went to a very few people and the effort was done by a lot of people and so you have a lot of people holding up supporting and and generally making a good life for very few people and that system has existed through uh, you know feudal times all the way up to today where it still exists it looks a little different now, but basically, <coughs> barring government programs, if you don't work, you don't eat. You don't have a place to live. You don't have stuff. You don't get anything. If you do work, well, if you're lucky, you get stuff for it. If you're not lucky, you get not very much stuff. So you have people working really, really hard, doing all sorts of terrible jobs, <coughs> and getting paid next to nothing and living in poverty and then you have people that just sort of sit there and reap the benefits of all of that and sometimes the reaping of those benefits is having some big cushy job where you get a lot of money for not doing very much work like corporate lawyer or upper management or something like that so it's not it's it's no longer uh, the king and the subjects or, or, or something of that sort, it's, it's a little more spread out, but it's still kind of the same system. And to that end, I thought I would read this letter, which I think w is fascinating. I've, I've seen this before, <coughs> but it, it seems really appropriate to read here on Labor Day. <laughs> and this is a letter from a freedman to his old master. I, uh, you're probably familiar with this. At some point in your life, it seems you must have heard this, but this really doesn't hurt to read it again. So a little background here. Uh, in 1825, at the approximate age of eight, Jordan Anderson, sometimes spelled Jordan, J-O-R-D-O-N, as opposed to J-O-R-D-A-N, was sold into slavery and would live as a servant of the Anderson family for 39 years. In 1864, the Union Army camped out on the Anderson plantation, and he and his wife, Amanda, were liberated. That's Jordan and his wife. <coughs> the couple eventually made it to safety 
In Dayton, Ohio, and in July 1865, Jordan received a letter from his former owner, Colonel P.H. Anderson. The letter kindly asked Jordan to return to work on the plantation because it had fallen into disarray during the war. On August 7th, 1865, Jordan dictated his response through his new boss, Valentine Winters, and it was published in the Cincinnati Commercial. The letter entitled, Letter from a Freedman to His Old Master, was not only hilarious, but it showed compassion, defiance, and dignity. That year, the letter would be republished in the New York Daily Tribune and Lin Lydia Marie Child's The Freedman's Book. The letter mentions a Miss Mary, Colonel Anderson's wife, Martha, Colonel Anderson's daughter, Henry, most likely Colonel Anderson's son, and George Carter, a local carpenter. <coughs> so think about this in terms of Labor Day. This is, is a good letter for Labor Day. So uh, this might be a letter from you to your old boss, <laughs> perhaps. Anyway, Dayton, Ohio, August 7th, 1865. To my old master, Colonel P.H. Anderson, Big Spring, Tennessee. Sir, I got your letter and was glad to find that you had not forgotten Jordan and that you wanted me to come back and live with you again, promising to do better for me than anybody else can. I have often felt uneasy about you. I thought the Yankees would have hung you long before this for harboring rebs they found at your house. I suppose they never heard about your going to Colonel Martin's to kill the Union soldier that was left by his company in their stable. Although you shot at me twice before I left you, I did not want to hear of your being hurt, and I'm glad you are still living. It would do me good to go back to the dear old home again and to see Miss Mary and Miss Martha and Alan, Esther Green, and Lee. Give my love to them all and tell them I hope we will meet in the better world, if not in this. I would have gone back to see you all when I was working in the Nashville hospital, but one of the neighbors told me that Henry intended to shoot me if he ever got a chance. I want to know particularly what the good chance is you propose to give me. I am doing tolerably well here. I get $25 a month with victuals and clothing, have a comfortable home for Mandy, and folks call her Mrs. Anderson, and the children, Millie, Jane, and Grundy, go to school and are learning well. The teacher says Grundy has a head for a preacher. They go to Sunday school, and Mandy and me attend church regularly. We are treated kindly. Sometimes we overhear others saying, them colored people were slaves down in Tennessee. The children feel hurt when they hear such remarks, but I tell them it was no disgrace in Tennessee to belong to Colonel Anderson. Many darkies would have been proud, as I used to be, to call you master. Now, if you will write and say what wages you will give me, I will be better able to decide whether it would be to my advantage to move back again. As to my freedom, which you say I can have, there's nothing to be gained on that score. As I got my free papers in 1864 from the Provost Marshal General of the Department of Nashville, Mandy says she would af be afraid to go back without some proof that you were disposed to treat us justly and kindly, and we have concluded to, to test your sincerity by asking you to send us our wages for the time we served you. This will make us forget and forgive old scores and rely on your justice and friendship in the future. I served you faithfully for 32 years, and Mandy 20 years. At $25 a month for me and $2 a week for Mandy, our earnings would amount to $11,680. Add to this the interest for the time our wages have been kept back, and deduct what you paid for our clothing and three doctor's visits for me and pulling a tooth for Mandy, and the balance will show that we are in justice entitled to. Show what we are in justice entitled to. Please send the money by Adams Express in care of V. Winters, Esquire, Dayton, Ohio. If you fail to pay us for faithful labors in the past, we can have little faith in your promises in the future. We trust the good maker has opened your eyes to the wrongs which you and your fathers have done to me and my fathers in making us toil for you for generations without recompense. Here I draw my wages every Saturday night, but in Tennessee... There was never any payday for the Negroes any more than for the horses and cows. Surely there will be a day of reckoning for those who defraud the laborer of his hire. 
In answering this letter, please state if there would be any safety for my Millie and Jane, who are now grown up and are both good-looking girls. You know how it was with poor Matilda and Catherine. I would rather stay here and starve and die, if it come to that, than have my girls brought to shame by the violence and wickedness of their young masters. You will also please state if there has been any schools open for colored children in your neighborhood. The great desire of my life now is to give my children an education and have them form virtuous habits. Say howdy to George Carter and thank him for taking the pistol from you when you were shooting at me. From your old servant, Jordan Anderson. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> that pretty much speaks for itself in, in a wonderful way, in a wonderfully understated way. Just right, smooth, hand it to him, and st <laughs> I won't say what else, but it's just a wonderful letter, and I always get a kick out of, of reading it. But it really does speak to the, the relationship of the laborer and the person that hires the laborer and, and how, you know, the only way, the only thing that you have that tells you you are respected and your labor is respected is your paycheck, basically. I mean, you can be treated well, that's important, and good working conditions and good treatment, um, you know, that goes a long way towards towards speaking of respect. But, you know, in the end, you expect to be paid what you're worth. And it never happens because, naturally, according to capitalism, it can't happen. The only way someone can afford to hire you to labor for them is if they can make a profit off your work. If after paying you, they still, your labor has given them enough more than that so that they make some money. Otherwise, they can't hire you because if, if all they could, if you, they paid you everything that you made for them, then it, they break even. They don't make any money. That's what capitalism tells us. That's the excuse why the owner or the boss or whoever has to make more than what they pay you for. And so that sets up a, an adversarial relationship. If I want to make money with my business, I have to try to pay people the least amount of money possible to do the work for me so that I can make money because that's how I make money. How they make money is by doing work and trying to get paid a good wage for it. How I make money is by getting them to work for me and paying them little enough that I make money off of their labor. And that's how it works. Um, so something to think about next time you're, you're praising the virtues of capitalism. So here, here's some interesting stuff from 2015. This is from the government. Uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. So in 2015, there were 26.3 million foreign-born persons in the U.S. labor force, comprising 16.7% of the total. So in 2015, 16.7% of the total workers in the U.S. were foreign-born persons. So uh, notice how I'm connecting Labor Day, labor, and immigration. Um, Hispanics accounted for 48.8% of the foreign-born labor. Asians accounted for 24.1%. Um, okay, there's a lot of uh, business here about data, who, this, how they figured out who was white, black, or Asian, or whatever. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So, so it says, data in this news release for persons who are white, black, or Asian do not include those of Hispanic or Latino ethnicity. Data on persons of Hispanic or Latino ethnicity, ethnicity can't say that, are presented separately. Okay, so anyway. Uh, Foreign-born workers were more likely than native-born workers to be employed in service occupations, natural resources, construction, and maintenance operation, production, transportation, material moving occupations. Native-born workers were more, more likely than foreign-born workers to be employed in management, professional, and related occupations, and sales and office occupations. So I, I, I can see virt your virtual ears 
pricking up there at, at that bit there. So after discussing who gets paid what and how this money is sort of how the effort of the laborer is used to benefit the um, person, the employer, or, and or upper management, you see right here that there is, is a, an imbalance between the foreign-born workers and the native-born workers in terms of who gets what kind of jobs and presumably, almost undoubtedly, how people are paid for that. So next time you hear someone mention uh, all these illegals or whatever coming here and taking our jobs, all these immigrants coming here and taking our jobs, um, think about that. So you have, let's say, a company, Acme. That's a good one from the cartoon days, the Acme Corporation. So the foreign-born workers were more likely than native-born workers to be employed in service occupations, natural resources, construction, and maintenance occupations, production, transportation, and material moving occupations. So in the, in, in the cafeteria of Acme, foreign-born workers. In the, in the natural resources, uh, I think here they probably mean uh, you know farm work and that sort of thing. But uh, we will say also for uh, mining the raw materials or whatever that Acme makes its products out of, mostly foreign-born workers. Construction, building the Acme's many factories, foreign-born workers. Maintenance, keeping everything clean, foreign-born. Production, working on the assembly line, transportation, driving the trucks foreign-born workers, material moving occupations, foreign-born workers. So the immigrants, they're doing all that stuff to make Acme a profitable company. Where do those profits go? Well, some of it goes to pay these foreign-born workers, yes, but they are low-skilled jobs, low-wage jobs. So the, 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 the profit off of their productivity moves up to management. Who is in management? Oh, native born workers were more likely to be employed in management, professional and related occupations, sales and office occupations. So the people who are benefiting, the people who are getting higher salaries, who are taking advantage of the, the labor by the foreign born workers are the native born workers. So, uh, yeah, maybe taking some jobs maybe coming here and taking some jobs, but th through their labor and the way that labor is utilized in the capitalist system, anyway, they are benefiting everybody else. Everybody else in this gigantic Acme Corporation, from the head office on down to the sales clerks, to the uh, you know secretaries, all that sort of thing, the managers, all those people are able to be paid because of the labor of the people doing the actual work. Who's doing the actual work? Mostly foreign-born workers. Uh, who's getting most of the money from that? Native-born workers. So, uh, you know, when, when you hear about immigrants coming and taking our jobs, that is one one, not the only, but one aspect of it to be considered. If you care to consider it. Okay. The median usual weekly earnings of foreign-born full-time wage and salary workers were $681 a week in 2015, compared with $837 for their native-born counterparts. But it is really vitally important to remember how labor is rewarded and who makes money off of what in this system. Because we're so indoctrinated. I mean, we still use the same stories that I was talking about earlier, that where, we, where you're talking about, you know, the, you know, the industrious rabbit and the lazy fox or whatever. I can't even think, I can't remember what animals did what, but, you know, those same stories that were to teach you that if you wanted to get anything, you had to work for it, which made sense in a, a system where if you wanted to, 
have uh, some venison for dinner, you had to go out and hunt for it. If you wanted to eat some corn, you had to go grow it. If you wanted water, you had to go to the well, pump it, and bring it back. If you wanted a house, you had to build it. If you wanted clothes, you had to put them together. That world and the lessons from that world were if you want something, you have to work hard for it. Well, the, that story was co-opted. Those moral lessons, those important, uh, uh, you know, life instructions, I guess you might say, that are encoded in, the, in virtually every culture to some degree or another, were co-opted along the way, first by, uh, feudal, by the feudal system where you had lords and serfs, Hey, you want to? You want something out of life? You got to work hard. So get out there and and work hard, and then I'll send my uh, gleaners around, and we'll we'll uh, you know take two thirds of your crop, and then whatever's left is yours. So the harder you work, the more you're going to have left over after I take my royal cut. Um, on up to today's thing where oh, you want to work hard? Well, uh, here you want to get ahead. Here's a job for you. I will pay you minimum wage, uh, nine ninety five an hour or whatever it is, wherever I come from, and um, you know. And if you work enough hours, maybe some overtime. I might give you some overtime. Uh, maybe you get a second job or whatever. You'll you'll be able to pay your rent. Don't look behind the curtain and notice that I'm. I have, you know, six cars and uh, two summer homes and a helicopter. And, you know, don't notice that all the rich rewards of all that labor that's being done by the people that are getting paid minimum wage are going upwards to the managers, to the office personnel, to, um, you know, the boss, the owner or whatever. Don't notice that. Work hard. You'll get ahead. <clears throat> and, and so the, on Labor Day, I think it's really important to reflect on all of these things because we like to think that we're, you know, making these huge strides over the years, that, that we've come a long way. And now look at, you know, our ancestors. Oh, they lived in caves. They, you know, they shivered when it was cold out wrapped in furs and stuff and and now look at the luxury we have yes we've got luxury yes we're doing pretty well right now by comparison in all sorts of ways um, but the system is really out of balance in terms of who does the work versus who gets the rewards for that work that is still really out of balance and has been for a long, long time. As soon as someone fi figured out that if you could be bigger and stronger, you could get stuff and you wouldn't have to work for it because you could just force people to give it to you. And on to today, where big and strong now, now means rich and connected, whereas once it was just big muscles and, and quick with the old sword or something, now it's rich and connected. But it's the same bully system where I have the power to make you do things for me. It's a little nicer than it used to be. It used to be, and you don't like it, I'll chop your head off. Now, oops, now it's if you don't like it, well, you can go work for someone else then because that's how we do things here. And it's, it hasn't changed. It's changed in form, but not in, in the fundamentals not in substance. It is still substantively the same system. It's just been altered and cleaned up and made nice and it looks good and, and people don't mind it as much. <laughs>